everyone has heard of King John. The tyrant forced to go to war with his barons, leading to the signing of the Magna Carta. People probably know him from Robin Hood or other Hollywood productions. But I'm not here to delve into the realms of mythology, hearsay or legend. My mission is to unveil the man behind the myth. Who was King John? Richard Cor de Leon, the Lionheart, was dead, mortally wounded by a crossbow during the siege of Chaloux Cabron. Sources say it was a youth named Pierre Basile. However, he is also named as both Bertrand de Gordon and Jean Sabrol. Uh, so even back then, no one truly seemed to know who he was. Richard was said to have not only forgiven him, but paid the lad a hundred shillings. And this is what Richard was like after all, generous and honourable to the last. After all, this was a wound that could easily heal. Only upon botched surgery and the infection of gangrene did the wound become fatal. However, one source, and only one source, claims that Mercedier, one of Richard's men, a brute to the last, flayed and hung the boy. Yet this is one source, and written long after the fact. And it was Mercedier's surgeon who botched everything in the first place, so could even be a puff piece to regain some honour. Given that no one seems to have known who this lad actually was, the chances are that he neither got flayed nor rewarded, merely faded into the fog of time. John, whether in Brittany or Normandy, loyal or rebel, was informed of his brother's death and hastened to Chinon for the burial, and he arrived on the 14th of April, 1199. Everybody was waiting for him. They laid the fallen king to rest at Fontevraud Abbey, to be beside his father. He had reigned just ten years. He's around 42. Now, the abbess of Fontevraud, Matilda, had forbidden anyone to enter the crypts of the abbey. This included John. And even Eleanor couldn't persuade her, but John insists and causes a disturbance banging on the gates until Hugh of Lincoln, the bishop, remember this is a mixed church, the abbess is the one in charge. The bishop tells him to go away. He won't. So the bishop ends up gaining permission of Abbess Matilda to grant John inside, which happens. John was still there at the abbey nine days later on Easter Sunday, mourning over his brother. John attended Mass, but apparently refused Holy Communion. This gets a negative response from Hugh of Lincoln, which prompts the bishop to sit John through a sermon, a lengthy one, in which an impatient John has to nag him to cease. And apparently, there's a legend, no doubt written later with hindsight. The bishop shows John a mural, the righteous ascending to heaven, but John points to the sinners going to hell. I'd rather you show me these, whose examples I shall follow. And there were always tensions between him and the bishop, who had always thought that Eleanor of Aquitaine's marriage to Henry was adulterous. Her true husband, apparently, according to him, was in Paris. John swore an oath to preserve the laws and the customs, he was to be the new king. Finally, his time had come, though he still needed to secure his domain. A lot needed to be done. After all, lines had been drawn prior to this. Arthur still had support. By April the 18th, John was at Beaufort en Vale, a dozen or so miles from Anjou. As John's retinue made their way down the Loire, Arthur's supporters in Brittany sprang into action. On Easter Sunday, these rebels were in Anjou, rallying support for Arthur, their new king. John's retinue was small and stood no chance in the melee, 
his only option was to outrun them, reach Normandy before they. On Easter Monday, he set off with haste, swiftly covering the 50 miles to Le Mans by nightfall. John's heart must have sunk upon learning Philip had already invaded Normandy, capturing Evreux and advancing to Le Mans. John was trapped between the forces of Arthur and Philip. John fled in secret before dawn, escaping moments before the pincer closed. Arthur and his forces took Le Mans without error and soon joined by the French king. Andrew had been lost. Thankfully for John, Normandy was more forgiving. Yes, they remembered John's betrayal of Richard, but they understood the greater threat, Philip Augustus. William Marshall argues this to Walter Constance's ruin, who had to deal with John's mischief before. But the Marshal's logic was sound. People had to rally behind John, or the kingdom was done. And at Rouen, on the 25th of April, John was made the Duke of Normandy. Rouen himself, now on board, conducted the ritual personally, placing a coronet of golden roses on John's head. Though in Normandy, John must have been shifting his focus over the Channel. Before news of Richard's death arrives in England, and all hell breaks loose. Lawlessness, magnates acting like hungry wolves, according to Ralph of Cogsall. In wake of this, John remains in Normandy and sends in the Marshal and Hubert Walter to sort the problem out. John, meanwhile, has set his eyes on Andrew. The enemy had withdrawn from Limon. They couldn't stay there forever. He attacks the treacherous city without hesitation, crushing it, tearing down its walls in brutal vengeance, slinging many of the city leaders into prison. John then briefly joined with his mother at the far from frail and venerable Eleanor of Aquitaine. After all, she was in the area with her own military campaign, leading Richard's old mercenaries on lightning raids across the area of Aquitaine. After all, these were her lands, not Philip, not Arthur. Eleanor heads with her army deep into Angevin territory, and John heads for England. The situation in England was dire. Without a crowned king, the kingdom had descended into chaos. Hubert and the Marshal first demanded an oath of loyalty to John. However, there was a resistance. The situation was worse than expected. A magnates had begun fortifying castles, strengthening power. A meeting in Northampton was called no easy feat. For five out of the seven culprits were earls, people who had previously crushed John's rebellion and would never trust him. They knew his penchant for vengeance. But Marshal Ruin, the Judicia, Geoffrey Fitzpeter, they gave their word. They pledged for John. There would be no retribution. And finally, trust was gained. The chaos ended. Now, with all that out of the way, it was time for a coronation, which occurred on the 27th of May, 1199. John had landed on the Sussex coast just two days before, and with trepidation headed for London, Westminster. The very fact that he left it so long, testaments to this chaos, literally waiting until the last minute. And Ralph of Congressal claims that John snuck into England in secret, in hope to catch any grumblers in the act, a typical John move. Unlike today, coronations were always carried out with haste, very little preparation. The first Norman one only being in 1066, a ceremony created for William the Conqueror, who ruled that the ceremony itself made you king. It was to be solemn, deeply religious. This was a pact with God, but there was jubilation, pageantry, no punches pulled. No expense spared. Old Cogsall writes that it was conducted with great pomp and circumstance. John's coronation wasn't described in detail, but we know what occurred because his brother's was described in detail. And these are the same people conducting this one. John was to swear a threefold oath, protect and honour the church, abolish bad laws and replace with good, and do good justice for his subjects, uh, there was no parliament, no prime minister. His reign was absolute. All that would come later. Various parts of his body were anointed in holy oils, including his head, and remained there for seven days and seven nights. Uh, during this week, uh, John would wear a special coif 
with straps tied under the chin. He was dressed in royal robes and crown. A crown so heavy it required two earls to support it. And he was finally seated on the throne while mass began. After the ritual, he and his nobles walked, and there was no royal coach back in these days, the brief distance to Westminster Hall for the obligatory banquet. And what a banquet it was! Just for starters, you had 21 fat oxen from Worcestershire and 2,000 yards of table linen. It might give you an idea of scale of this. William Marshall and Geoffrey Fitzpeter were made to be earls, belted with swords of office. Uh, they sat at the high table, as did Hubert Walter, Archbishop, who was elected Chancellor. The only irritant was William the Lion of Scotland. Now, as a child, he inherited Northumbria. He was an earl. Henry II took it back, but William never gave up. John was already aware of this. He had been prepped, and now the Scottish king demanded it back, or he would take it by force. John tries diplomacy. Meet at Northampton. Discuss it. As soon as the coronation was done, John set off. But William the Lion was a no-show. Instead, he now demands more territory. He gave John the biblical 40 days, in which time he raised an army. John was hearing nothing at this point. He was already raising his own army. He left the problem with Northumbria to William de Stouffville and then headed straight for Normandy with a mighty host. Eleanor, meanwhile, was already doing well as she had rallied the troops of Poitou, launched an attack on Tor in a direct attempt to capture Arthur. He escaped by the skin of his teeth, but the noose was tightening. The Arthur's escape drew only fire from Philip. Eleanor was in need of aid. On the 20th of June, John lands in Dip, the full host, and Normandy was rallying to John. Philip knew his fun was at an end. A truce was agreed, although a, a mere two months. And John wasn't playing games anymore. John visits castles, towns, making sure defences were sound, fortifying strongholds, gaining allies. You see, Richard had gathered strong support against Philip Augustus. He couldn't possibly lose. Philip's support was evaporating, and the truce expired on the 16th of August. Uh, the two kings tried parley, meeting on the Seine between Leandelay and Venon, and near the legendary Chateau Gaillard, which Richard had built. Days of talks, two stubborn men. John wants to know why Philip hates him, and they were friends, to an extent. Philip argues Normandy is rightfully French, and John took it without permission. He should have paid homage to the French king. Uh, basically, Philip wanted a vix on. It was a long shot, and John rejected it. The Normans stopped being French vassals in 1066. Everybody knew that. Sure, previous kings gave it lip service, but Henry II resisted. The Plantagenets were independent. This was the Andrevon Empire. All lip service, John gave Philip as a rebel, but it died the second he became king. It was Andrevon. These were his territories by birthright. And on the 18th of August, all parley was over. England and France were at war again. And the Count of Boulogne joined John. Incidentally, a Givas of Canterbury, a monk, claims that the English king resisted the French king like a man and fought for the peace of his country. And this was the same monk who, along with five other monks in Canterbury, recalled his strange goings on in Moon, possibly an asteroid hit. Now, Philip struck first, augmenting his gains in Normandy and seizing Conch. But John had no doubt waited for his enemy to make the first move, and in September, John advanced into Maine, and the war swayed to and fro, and Philip utterly demolished the castle at Boulogne. William de Roche meets John. He was a baron in Maine. Previously, he backed Arthur after serving Henry for decades. The destruction of Boulogne forces him to switch allegiance. He swears fealty to John. Philip should have given it to Arthur instead of burning it to the ground. John was winning this war. More, William de Roche has a plan to lure Arthur and his mother Constance into a meeting with John, an alliance. 
Arthur was ready to relinquish all claims to the throne of England. Emboldened by this, John throws his forces at Philip, who had just retaken Limon, well, a castle nearby. Tactically unsound, Philip withdrew. He allows Arthur to be in the hands of William de Roche. He assumed de Roche was still loyal, and de Roche allows John in Limon without a squabble. A John in two weeks had accomplished more than Richard had in years. Philip was driven from Angevin territory. Importantly, Arthur now submitted to John. But let's explore this, for it would be only a victory briefly. Hours, in fact. Arthur, upon swearing fealty, told people that he was worried that John would not honour the deal. The young boy, clearly being pushed into this, he's genuinely worried, with reason, that John would imprison him, or worse. John's letters may have been strongly in favour of friendship with Arthur, but things were certainly off. Arthur, even at twelve, feared for his life. He slipped away under cover of darkness and headed straight for Andre. A John headed back to Limon, but his nephew had gone, slipped out of his fingers, and John chases Arthur around the country, but Arthur manages to escape to Philip in Thor, a young boy now safe from a vengeful uncle. John had lost his ace in the hole, outmaneuvered by a twelve-year-old boy. The new king had begun showing his true colours. It would be the Pope who'd step in to stop the war, because he sends a legate to mediate. There's a truce until the new year. Now, the Treaty of Jafar was long gone. Talks of a new crusade was in the air, and many French nobles had taken the cross by now, especially now this legate had arrived. The tables didn't turn, they flipped. By Christmas, John's support had collapsed. Philip had burnt a castle, but John had tried to enact vengeance on a boy imprison him, or worse, kill him. The two kings met again. Another attempt at peace. This time, it was John's time to relent. Conceding the Vexan and all castles acquired by Philip in Normandy, a sure Philip wanted to break his hold over Arthur. But John was done. Even to the point of paying homage to the French Augustus, in order to keep his Angevin claim, and John even agreed to pay 20,000 marks. The map was changing. Either way, it was an end of seven years of conflict. Any deal was a good deal by this time. John, for a start, didn't want war. He preferred peace. A war had killed two of his brothers, a third if jousting was an extension of war. At last of all, his father, a man broken by war. Even Philip was scarred by what he's seen in Altrima, on crusade. No, war wasn't for John. He had earned the name Soft Sword for a reason. He preferred politics. He was apparently a lover of peace, who wanted a tranquil life. And by prudence, not conflict, John had obtained the impossible. And after this expensive truce, the two kings embraced. Had peace truly been accomplished? Igivas of Canterbury certainly thought so. He writes that by prudence, not war, John had obtained peace. Although he also notes that these methods caused envious and malicious critics to name John Softsaw. So John clearly had the clergy side at least. Now, how were these treaties traditionally made? Yep, with a marriage. Philip's son Louis would marry John's niece Blanche, strengthening the truce. Thus, the far from feeble are taking in mind she is in her mid 70s at this point. Eleanor of Aquitaine sets out to the Breens to collect her granddaughter. All is going well. On the continent, at least, it seems the troubles were over. However, new troubles back in England happened almost immediately. And no sooner had John crossed the Channel, in February 1200, he is greeted by grumblers. It's our old friend, Ralph of Coggeshall, who tells us 
in the Chronicon Anglicanum that the 20,000 marks that were too much to bear as a new tax had to be levied to raise the funds. Peace might actually be more expensive than the war. Talking of old acquaintances, William the Lion of Scotland appears to have piped down and never went through with his threats of raising an army. For William's initial courage was bolstered with the knowledge that John would be distracted by the conflict on the continent. However, with the treaty, that all changed. All courage now deserted William, and he refuses to meet John in Parliament in York. Herbert York wasn't without any discussions, though, as Cistercian abbots arrive. Cistercians had traditionally been exempt from tax, and suddenly had been given a bill to help raise funds for the new treaty. John tells them exactly where to go, and when they refuse to pay, John orders a pogrom, persecuted brutally, and no actions against any who harm them. The abbots run to the Archbishop of Canterbury, good old Hubert Walter, who promptly puts a stop to it, denouncing the king as a cruel persecutor of the Holy Church. Spitting with rage, and not being able to cower Walter, John sets sail yet again to Normandy, this time to complete the Treaty of Goulet. Meanwhile, the old and venerable Eleanor proved too frail to complete her journey, so passed on the deliverance of Blanche uh, to the Archbishop of Bordeaux, while Eleanor rested. Then, some days later, on the 18th of May, 1200, John and Philip completed uh, the aforementioned truce, and on the 22nd at Lugulet, an island on the Seine, uh, the treaty was sealed. Even though the treaty wouldn't last, or the marriage would, a Blanche of Castile and the future Louis VIII would spend their lives together and would have many children. It would be a marriage that would prove decisive to the barons in 15 years' time when deciding the fate of the English throne. But that is another story. For now, peace had been obtained between the two feuding kings and Arthur was to pay homage to John. War was finally over. Or was it? John was taking no chances, and when he set out to claim lands that had previously resisted him, he advanced with a large army. He ended up taking around 150 hostages, no doubt sons of nobles, as encouragement of loyalty. And when he arrived in Aquitaine, he could finally settle old disputes and grudges, again settled with a marriage. It seemed everyone was getting married but John. His previous marriage to Isabella of Gloucester was loveless and barren. He had wanted it annulled for years. He only married her because of his brother Richard, and only upon becoming king could he complete the annulment on the grounds of consanguinity. She was out of his life now. Of course, he kept her lands. Of course, she didn't contest this. Well, you see, her nephew Amori had lost his lands in France under the new treaty. So John compensated this by granting him the earldom of Gloucester. So the title still kept within her family and later, upon John's death, would go back to her anyway. The annulment was controversial with the clergy, but John was looking for allies against Philip, not allies in the church. He turned his lustful gaze to Portugal and the king's daughters he sent ambassadors there, but this may have been a ruse to poke at Philip, as what happens next makes it all clear. In May 1200, Eleanor of Aquitaine falls ill, and John is by her side, at the Abbey of Front of All, where she has since retired. She'd be fine but suggests her son visit nearby lands, especially La Marche, the domain of Hugh de Lusion. Here, he'd meet someone who'd change history, the 13-year-old daughter of Ama of Angoulême, Isabella. Roger of Wendover reports 
it was as if she'd held him by sorcery or witchcraft. The king was 33, 20 years her senior, but this was the dawn of the 13th century. The past is a foreign place. Things were done differently there. We cannot judge the past by our own standards. Otherwise, in the eyes of future historians, we are buggered. News arrives at court. Aymer, the Count of Angoulême, had just kidnapped his daughter, Isabella, from the residence of Lusion, the Count of Marsh, a powerful magnate, thus preventing the marriage. Yet naturally, Hugh de Marsh, Hugh de Lusion, is furious. He's with John at the time, but his protest get him nowhere. He deduced that this was a part of a plot and storms out in rage. His suspicions are proven correct. As John was in Angoulême on the 24th of August and married the young Isabella himself. Marrying this new bride wasn't easy, as initially the church opposed it. The union might also prove illegitimate. Uh, this time her age was most likely in question. Her only been around 12, possibly younger. Not normal even for this era. Might even explain how even Hugh hadn't already been married. Whatever the case, John was king and was used to getting his own way. Roger of Howden claims the king acted on impulse, but reality is clearly political. Hugh was a powerful magnate and held the county of Le Marche, lands previously under the control of Eleanor. Apparently, he even kidnapped the venerable former queen, or at the very least threatened to, forcing her to sign away the county. Although the marriage would be loveless and hateful. Isabella was likened to Jezebel, a she-wolf. Allegedly, she had many other lovers who John dispatched. But Eleanor was certainly impressed, as John took his bride to Chinon, then Fontevaux. Now, remember Bishop Hugh of Lincoln, well, he dies of old age in Lincoln's Inn, which is in London, not Lincoln. Here he writes a prophecy, of the ruin of the Angevin Empire. Unnervingly accurate and written contemporary to the time, his dislike of adultery and wickedness for all to read, a curse more than a prophecy, this was his wish. If God was to grant him one thing, Grant him this. Philip of France shall utterly destroy this race. In all irony, John was one of the bishop's pallbearers. The clergyman must have been spinning in his grave. Here, John plans to ignite the persecution of the Sturcens, but sees logic and ceases. Now, there was still a lot to do affairs of state done, he summons the King of Scots once again. A delegation, a bishop supporting three earls and four barons. Surely he'd accept John as his lord. Begrudgingly, King William of Scots met John in Lincoln, November the 21st. The whole city came out to meet them. People had come from miles, including Scotland and Normandy. William still wanted Northumbria. John says no. Matter postponed. John settled the matter with the Circassians, who had come all this way. They'd been told by Hubert Walter, the Archbishop of Canterbury, to treat with the king. They grovelled on their hands and knees, and to their surprise, they got their way. John, in tears, ended their persecution there and then, promising to protect them a new monastery would be built. He even wanted to be buried there. How much of this was sincere, we don't know. But at least it was said. The matter was over. Most of John's problems were over. John could finally rest, spending Christmas at Guildford. Everything that was bugging him had been resolved. And in the new year, or 1201, 
and the new king and queen headed back up north for a royal tour. Things were looking good. Aside from his now frail mother, around 80, falling ill again. Not that she stopped, determined to run affairs. Eleanor of Aquitaine was certainly as formidable as the chroniclers suggest. Hugh de Lusion was not going to take humiliation lying down, not at all. He starts attacking John's castles in Aquitaine, joined by his uncle, a veteran crusader. The whole of Poitou was offended on behalf of the venerable lady Eleanor of Aquitaine in Forteville, her military days having passed. They took up her banner. She sends her secretary, G. Diva, on a desperate errand, deliver letters to her beloved son. The Lusions were at war. John responds in kind, demanding Le Marche be captured, handed over to Aimer of Angoulême. Even Ralph, the brother in Normandy, wasn't safe from John's vengeance, even though he had nothing to do with it. An example had to be made. This was John. Meanwhile, Eleanor of Aquitaine summons Arthur, who's only around 15 at this point in time. She pleads him to stay out of the conflict, makes him swear oaths. He would keep peace. Only a short time later, the boy would lose his mother, Constance. Childbirth being a blessing and a curse. The problem was, all this politicking jeopardised the Treaty of Goulet. Philip was John's overlord, and Dulusion was good with Philip. They complained to the French Augustus, and John wasn't happy. Peace was eventually agreed upon, and the treaty still kept intact for now. John even hopped over to Normandy, staying at Chateau Gaillard. From there to Paris, staying at Philip's royal residence in 1201. Of course, a prank was pulled by the French, for they supplied John and his men with the worst wines in France, apparently, which got them drunk with many an embarrassing tale. The French kept the good wine for themselves. These are all rumours, uh, because other sources say that they had the good champagne and they ate well. But this is an example of the kind of pettiness that was going on back then. But the joke was on Hugh de Lusion. Yes, John agreed to the treaty. Yes, peace was restored. Yes, he may have had some bad wine. But John had a penchant for cruelty. At this moment in time, his preferred method of execution was locking people up and starving them to death. John was cruel. He charges Hugh de Lusion with treason. A judicial duel was demanded, trial by combat, an archaic law. Even in this period of time, it's rarely observed. John hired the best fighters in the land. Oh, basically, it was war by the back door. They complained to Philip again, who did his best, but John filibusters his way through the process. This goes on for the rest of the year, and by 1202, the tension looked to snap. John makes it clear he is no vassal of Philip, who wants John to stand trial in Paris, which after months of delay, John finally agrees, <laughs> though it's just words. John has no intention of obeying Philip Augustus. The Treaty of Goulet was broken. Philip invades Normandy, taking Ottavon Castle, then raises it, no mercy, taking castle after castle, Philip had been expecting this. He had been preparing for months, not trusting John one bit. Philip had already knighted the now teenage Arthur of Brittany and worked out a marriage, and with 200 knights and a good size of retinue, Arthur joined forces with the Dulusion and plunged into battle. Their target, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who had put aside her frail demeanor ever she had one, and left Fonteville, raising an army of her own, furious at her grandson Arthur. 
that they caught her at Mirabu, and she threw her retinue behind the walls, sending a single message to her son John. Her forces were under siege. They were outnumbered, outmatched, outprovisioned. This was the long defeat. By the 30th of July, 1202, Gideva again reached the king, this time at Le Mans. John already reacting to the conflict. He had no idea what had occurred, had no idea his mother was under siege. He sets off at once, covering the 80 or so miles of the now hostile territory between Le Mans and Mirabeau. He made the journey in 48 hours. Arthur and Hugh were doing so well. The siege was going to plan. Eleanor, beleaguered, had retreated to the keep. They only planned to exhort a ransom, nothing malicious. Revenge on John. Arthur and Eleanor even negotiate with her stalling. This could all blow over. She promised to make sure of it. Arthur declines. Nothing out the ordinary had they been dealing with a man with a rational mind. After all, this was the usual way of dealing with sieges and ransoms, etc. Unfortunately, they were dealing with John, a psychopath whose mother was in peril. One morning, on the 1st of August, Arthur and Hugh were enjoying breakfast. They were eating roast pigeons. Then disaster struck. It must have felt like God himself abandoned them. For John and William the Roche descended upon their foe, scattering them, tearing their forces asunder. Almost every one of Arthur's retinue was slain or captured. This was a massacre. Of all of the prisoners, only around 250 knights in total survived. Their ranks were irrelevant. Slung in chains, loaded onto ox carts and paraded through every town they passed, ending up in dungeons from England to Normandy. Hugh de Luzion was imprisoned in Cairn, locked in a tower. Philip, losing the upper hand, withdrew from Normandy, but not before plundering poor and putting it to the torch, and then returning to Paris to sulk. Hugh and the 15 year old Arthur were now prisoners at the mercy of a psychopath. Hugh de Luzion secures freedom with ransom and fealty, but not poor Arthur. He was far too important. He was imprisoned at Falaise under the William of Bros, his fate yet to be decided. When John parts with Eleanor, her returning back to Fontevall, she demands John not harm Arthur. Upon the arrival at the Abbey, Eleanor gave one last nod to her previous life and relinquished all duties before taking the veil and her rightful place with the nuns. Meanwhile, John meets with his nephew, the rebellious Arthur, apparently promising a similar deal to Luzion. Ransom and fealty. But Arthur seems to reject this, apparently indoctrinated by Philip. Ill-advised, at least according to Roger of Wendover, he simply won't swear fealty. John summons the magnates, who tell him Arthur is problematic. Upon their counsel, John demands his nephew to be blinded and castrated. The royal claim stops now. But when the lad bursts into tears, the assassins falter, and Hubert de Burr intervenes, ridding his presence of the brutes, protecting Arthur. Hubert lets the story of Arthur's death get out, before sneaking the boy to Philip. At least, that's what was said. Because Arthur was never seen again. He never reaches Philip. Roger of Wendover claims that John had Arthur moved to Rouen, imprisoned in a tower, made Robert du Vupont Seneschal, granting him two castles. Then suddenly, Arthur vanishes from history. Thus, the perfect crime. Add to this 
William de Bros. One day, on the 2nd of April, 1203, William tells John that he was relinquishing his guardianship of Arthur. A strange thing to say, unless he knew something was planned. According to the Annals of Margam, connected with William de Bros, John was drunk on strong wine, possessed by the devil himself, struck the boy down in a fit of rage, tying the body to a rock and casting him into the same. These monks even say that fishermen found the body and it was secretly buried at Notre Dame de Pré. Either way, the boy just reached his majority was no more. Bells tolled for the boy's death. His clothes donated to lepers. But it wasn't safe to speak his name in front of John, even after death. There is an odd letter given to a brother John. It clearly deals with Arthur's death. And is King John corresponding with Eleanor? It suggests familiarity with the matter. Talks in hints as the subject matter was sensitive. Assumes Eleanor would appreciate the news. Was she complicit? She wanted to spare Arthur. Did she change her mind? Was something else going on? We may never know. But the French certainly had their suspicions. Philip goes on a rampage, heading down the Loire, taking Andrew and swiftly occupying Le Mans. Brittany rises up also, cutting off Normandy. Now chroniclers, especially Roger of Wendover, are unkind to John's reaction. They claim the king was indifferent, uncaring, but as usual, written in hindsight after the fact. In reality, John was far from idle. He tries negotiating to no avail. He's possibly just killed Arthur of Brittany, the logical heir to the throne, a boy. It was controversial back then when he tried to do it the first time round, but now apparently he has succeeded. There would be no peace. John tries the Pope, who threatens Philip with condemnation, but there would be no peace. John fights back, taking castles in return, but the French had the initiative. It all rested on the legendary fortress, Chateau Gaillard.